Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings during this time of social distancing. We have a live stream at 10 a.m. on Sundays at facebook.com slash firstinyourheart. You may also find more information on our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. It may feel odd to have moved into the season of Easter, a season of celebration in the midst of these difficult times. Perhaps it's an opportunity to really take into consideration that at the heart of our Christian faith, we are called to live our lives in the belief that death is not the final word. This is what Christians are called, why Christians are called Easter people. The tomb becomes the womb of new life. What would we do differently if we really believed we are loved beyond all ending, that there was nothing to fear, that God's peace was always with us? Today we imagine Jesus at our right hand, counseling us through our days. With these words, peace be with you. This is what he did when he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. They were in a locked room fearing for their lives. Sound familiar? Let's let Jesus speak these words to us as well. Here is how the story from the Gospel of John goes. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciple told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and put my finger in the marks of the nail, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the door was shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the good news for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So today is sort of an unusual worship service. As I said, Easter is a time of celebration. And when at least I'm planning out worship services for Easter tide, between Easter and Pentecost, it's a time of celebration, still singing some of the great songs of Easter, hearing and celebrating the resurrection of Christ. What that normally also brings is I'm on vacation the first the week after Easter, the first second Sunday of Easter. I'm not normally here, and we're not as full as we are at Easter, but you would be sitting here as well, but you are not, and I'm here, and the person who is supposed to be preaching for me is still in Albuquerque with his daughters. 
And I even changed what I was planning on preaching on after Easter in order to better reflect and to give voice to the space and time in which we're in. So I give thanks to Marsha McPhee for creating the idea of this uh, worship series on very short uh, notice. And it begins with what is the traditional reading for the second Sunday of Easter, the first Sunday after Easter, which is that passage from John and the story of Doubting Thomas. Although this passage really is not actually about Thomas. And let me say that I think that Thomas has gotten a bad rap over the millennia, uh, particularly with the moniker of Doubter that's put in front of his name whenever we talk about Thomas. That's sort of the first thing that comes to our mind. And yet we don't talk about denying Peter or even betraying Judas, but somehow this word has been stuck. Doubting is stuck with Thomas, even though the story doesn't justify that reality. So Mary Magdalene has gone to the tomb on Easter morning, she, and she eventually encounters the risen Christ. In St. John's account that she reaches out to touch him, and Jesus says, no, don't touch me, I think, in order to keep that social distancing in place. Then she says to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, but do the disciples believe it? No, they don't. And we can see that that's the case because we're told that on that night, on the Sunday evening, the disciples are locked up in a room and the doors are all locked. We're told because they are fearful. And why? It says that they're fearful of the Jews. And so we need to be reminded here how quickly that passage can turn into anti-Semitism, which was not intended by the original writer, because he's writing to the disciples and to the original Christians who, for the most part, are Jewish. But then Jesus appears to them, walking through a closed, clo closed door, and he gives his greeting, peace be with you. And then I think there should be probably an ellipsis here, because it appears that something has happened after Jesus' greeting, before the next line, because then it says that after he said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. But why would Jesus do that unless the disciples had asked to see his wounds to make sure it was Jesus who had actually walked through the closed door? And I think that because it says after Jesus has done this, after he has shown them his wounds, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. That is, they had not believed the testimony of Mary, who says she's seen the Lord, and they didn't believe it was Jesus until they saw his wounds. But for some reason, Thomas is not with the disciples that night. He's not locked up in the room. Perhaps it was his turn to go to the store to see whether they had toilet paper or paper towels. Yes. Or perhaps he just wasn't afraid. He didn't feel the need to be locked up in that room, and so he was going out and doing the things that needed to be done. But for whatever reason, Thomas isn't there, and when he gets back, the disciples say to him exactly the same thing that Mary has said to them, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas doesn't believe it. And Thomas says that unless he sees the marks on his hands and on his side, he won't believe it. And then he adds, unless he can put his fingers in the wounds, then he won't believe. Now, except for that addition of him saying he wants to touch the wounds, his demands to believe in the risen Christ are exactly the same thing the disciples themselves had set up. So why is he called the doubter? But a week later, the disciples are gathered again in a closed room, and Jesus appears. But notice that this time when he appears, we're not told that the disciples are afraid, and we are not told that the doors are locked, something we'll come back to in just a moment. But Jesus again greets them, and he tells Thomas, put your hands into my wounds. And he doesn't chastise Thomas for this demand. There's no indication that Jesus is looking down at Thomas for having made this demand. Instead, he accedes to the request that Thomas has made. And although the most common translations have Jesus saying to Thomas, do not doubt but believe, hence we get that moniker of doubting, a literal translation of the Greek is, 
Do not be unbelieving, but believe. So the question here is not about doubting, it's about belief or unbelief. Now, should have Tom Thomas have believed the testimony of Mary and of the disciples? Yeah, he probably should have, but they didn't believe it either. They didn't believe it from Mary. They didn't believe it until they had seen the risen Christ, until they had seen the wounds on his side and in his hands. But Thomas's response, his confession of faith of my Lord and my God, is one of the Christological high points of the Gospel of John, indeed of the entirety of the New Testament, of understanding truly what the resurrection means for who Christ is. So this story of Thomas is not one of rebuke or admonishments, as is so often perceived. It's a story of hope and of promise. And more importantly, it's not even truly about Thomas at all. It's about Jesus and about the testimony given from the earliest witnesses about the resurrection of Christ and whether we will believe that or not believe. So I want to return to, to Jesus and his message to the disciples in that room, the greetings that he gives to them. Because three times Jesus gives the greeting, peace be with you. And this can be seen as simply a welcome, as shalom alechem, which means something like peace be upon you or peace be with you, is still given by people, by, by Jews, uh, people who are speaking Hebrew. But there's something greater and deeper in this message that Jesus is giving, this greeting, these words that Jesus is giving to the disciples. Because when we hear the word peace, our normal understanding of that word is the absence of violence or war, there's lack of conflict amongst people, things are quiet, people are at rest, that we're all sort of getting along. And this is one of those times in which our immediate understanding of the meaning of a word can get us somewhat close to what's happening, but can also stand in the way of truly understanding the meaning that Jesus is saying to the disciples and to us. And so Jesus isn't just saying here, may there be no conflict amongst you, or may there be no war. Because what Jesus understands, what the disciples in the first century would have understood, is that peace by itself can have negative connotations, negative repercussions, because that peace can be brought about by repression. So within the Roman Empire, they had Pax Romana, Roman peace, but it came about by saying, if you act up, we'll kill you. That's the reason Jesus is crucified as king of the Jews, because the Romans are saying, if you want to be a threat to us, we will make a lesson of you. And so they kill him. And so Jesus and the disciples understand that peace at the point of a sword is not true peace. And so Jesus, that's not the peace that he's bringing. Earlier in the Gospel of John, in what is known as the farewell discourse, Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, and I do not give as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let your hearts be afraid. Jesus' peace is not the peace of the world. It's not the peace of the Roman Empire, a peace at the point of a sword, which can bring about fear and troubled hearts. Jesus' is peace, what Jesus offers, is something more, something deeper. And so if you were here in Advent, the, the days leading up to Christmas, when we looked at the, the titles that were given to Christ from a passage in Isaiah, one of them was Prince of Peace. As Isaiah was using that term, peace, he was using the Hebrew word shalom. And there's lots of meanings for that word. Some of it means cessation of war, but it also has a meaning of safety or well-being, the contentment. And not just with yourself, but with others. But in the Greek, which is what all the Gospels were written in, the word for peace is Irene. And again, it can have a connotation of an absence of war. But more importantly for our understanding and purposes here and for the Gospel message, 
It also has the connotation of wholeness and of well-being, of healing, of restoration of relationship, of restoration of relationship with God, but also a restoration of relationship with each other, so that our relationships are whole and healthy and bring well-being to everybody. It's about that healing and wholeness, about living in and approaching the world with the spirits of the peace of God, and knowing that we are in God's hands. And it's obvious that the disciples don't have this peace on Easter because we're told that they are locked behind doors. And why? Because they're afraid. Because they are full of fear. But Jesus had said, I give you my peace, so do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. But we find the disciples locked up behind doors because they are fearful. Then Jesus appears to them and says, my peace be with you. Not just once, but twice. And then a week later, he again appears to them. And again, we're told that the doors are shut, but we're not told that they're locked, and we're no longer told that they are afraid. And so something has happened in that in-between space, between when they encounter the risen Christ and a week later. But their hearts have been changed in some fundamental ways. They are no longer afraid. And I think that distinction is incredibly important. But Jesus, again, when he appears to them that week later, still says, peace be with you. And perhaps it's a reminder of that peace that God is giving. Perhaps it's a, a booster, an inoculation shot, so they don't go back into the fear that they had before. Or maybe he says it because Thomas is there now, and he had not been there the first time. But the peace of Christ being with them, of them knowing it's there, is important. But that's not all that happens. Because in the first visit, after the second time Jesus says, peace be with you, Jesus also gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so remembering that normally on Pentecost, which comes the last Sunday of May this year, we... We celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, but that side of the story comes to us from Luke and Acts. John tells a very different story about the gift of the Spirit. And so here the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples immediately after the resurrection. And Jesus breathed the Spirit into the disciples. And the usage of that term, breathing, here is makes a clear connotation that we should be thinking back to God breathing the breath of life into Adam in the second creation story in Genesis 2. Or we should be thinking about Ezekiel's vision of the valley of the dry bones. And God says, will these bones live? And Ezekiel says, I don't know. Then God breathes into them the breath of life and they come back to life. So this is the breath of life being given to the disciples, the gift of the Holy Spirit being breathed into them and into us. And it's no coincidence that immediately before Jesus talks about giving them the gift of the Spirit earlier in John, but the passage immediately before that, Jesus says, when I go, I won't leave you alone. I will send the Holy Spirit. I will send the Advocate who will be here to help you to remember my teachings. Then he says, I will give you um, peace, not as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let your hearts be afraid. And so the peace of Christ is with us and the life of Christ is with us. The breath of God is with us. Whenever we breathe in and we breathe out as we did to begin this, to remember that breath of life being filling our bodies. So as we've been focusing on our breathing, it's about taking that deep breath and letting the peace of Christ fill us and calm us. Because we know in those moments when we're anxious, when we're afraid, when we're upset, that if you start taking deep breaths, then it will calm you down. And so as we breathe in, we should say, Spirit of God, fill me with your peace. 
to breathe it out. And focusing on that, of God's breath filling us and exiting from us, helps us to be at peace. It brings us healing and wholeness. It moves us away from our troubled and fearful and anxious hearts. It moves us out of fear and into God's peace. That is one of the gifts that we receive from God, and it is what is at the heart of the matter of who we are as Christians. We are a people of peace, people of wholeness and of healing, not just for ourselves, but for the whole world. As Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. He doesn't say, Blessed are the peace wishers, or the peace desirers. He says, blessed are the peace makers, those who go out and do. Those who not only offer healing and wholeness to the world, but are at peace with themselves. Who breathe in the breath of God. Who breathe in the peace of God. Who breathe in the power of God. And then breathe that same spirit out to the world. So I want you to think about what brings you peace. Where do you find healing and wholeness in your own life? When your heart is troubled, when your heart is fearful, what do you do to change that to find peace? Or what needs to happen to move you from fear and anxiousness to peace, as the disciples did? What do we need to do to find that peace in ourselves so that we can offer that peace to the world? Because Jesus, the risen and resurrected Christ, comes to us just as he did to the disciples, and he says, peace be with you. And I do not give as the world gives. I give peace and harmony, forgiveness and mercy, grace and glory, generosity and gratitude. I give the love and compassion of God the Father and the breath and the presence and the power of the spirits. I give these things to you, Christ says to us. I give them to you, so breathe them in. Let them seep into your deepest souls. Let them fill every soul in your body. Breathe them in. Until my healing and wholeness, my peace, are part of who you are and how you live. And know that even fearfully locked doors cannot keep out God's grace. Even fearfully locked doors cannot keep out God's grace because Jesus is there saying, Peace be with you. So may we indeed have hearts of peace, my brothers and sisters. Amen. And so I can invite you to lean over to those who are with you as we watch here this morning and say, Peace be with you. If you have several people around, have them all say that to those who are there. If you are by yourself, I invite you to text Peace Be With You to somebody else. Please don't text it to me because it will start beeping on the video here. But you can text me after worship is over. Or if texting is not something you're used to doing, make sure to call somebody after worship is done. And just say, Peace Be With You. You can place it in the comments section on Facebook as well, whatever it needs to be to help us to learn to live into God's peace and to also offer that peace to others. So peace be with you, my brothers and sisters.